There's one other subtlety in Raman spectroscopy that I want to explore now, and that has to do with the idea of polarization. Now, let's not confuse this with the topic I just covered about polarizability. Polarizability has to do with the ability to cause a change in the electron cloud. Polarization has to do with the polarization of the light being vertical or horizontal, just like Polaroid sunglasses when you're out driving, how they remove the glare. What I'm talking about here is the ability of the Raman spectrometer to be sensitive to the polarization of the light and the polarization of the scattering. Now, there are several origins to this. We'll talk about what it looks like in the instrument when we get there. But there are several origins for it. The, again, the classic molecule, as I promised at the outset, that we would look at is carbon tetrachloride. So that chlorine is coming out of the paper. This one's going back into it. So you have the four chlorines. And if, if I stand like this, I'm kind of a carbon tetrachloride molecule. I'm a tetrahedron. Okay, two chlorines, two chlorines for my feet, and I'm and the carbon in the middle. Now, one way that that molecule can move, that molecule can move in what are called normal modes. Those normal modes, represented mathematically by a Q, if you if you're looking in the literature, but those normal modes define the basic ways in which that molecule is uh, the linearly independent ways in which that molecule can vibrate. And nu one. The, the basic normal mode for nu1 is a symmetric stretch. What that means is all four of the chlorines are stretching simultaneously, going in and out. Now, that doesn't change the dipole. So if you were to look in the infrared spectrum, you would not see a peak there. Okay, But it does generate a sizable Raman peak. But the other interesting thing is, is that when I stretch those four chlorines, whether they're stretching or compressing, either way, it doesn't change the symmetry. The molecule has, to be mathematically correct about it, TD symmetry, tetrahedral. It's a tetrahedron. And when I stretch it, it's still a tetrahedron. It remains a tetrahedron. But because of this, as I look at the Raman scatter from the molecule, if I use a laser that is polarized, and I'm now going to introduce some nomenclature that we'll define better later, IVV and IVH, I'm going to send the laser in polarized vertically. And then I'm going to use my detector. The detector channel is also going to be polarized vertically. That's called VV. VH is when I rotate my detector polarization perpendicular. Now, obviously, there's four combinations, right? VV, HH, HV, you know, all the four. But the two that I'm really going to be concentrating on are VV, this one, and VH, this one. Now, in the case of VV, if I look at the, the new one, I get a large peak. If I look at the VH, I see almost nothing. And that's the key. The polarization of the Raman scatter is sensitive to this symmetry of the molecule. Go back to the benzene molecule that I talked about a moment ago. When the benzene molecule breathes, it's a D6H molecule. It's a six-fold symmetry, flat uh, six-fold symmetry. As it stretches, it's still D6H. It doesn't change because of that. That huge peak that comes out is also polarized and goes away. On the other hand, another motion of this, nu2 and nu3 of this molecule, involves scissor kicks where two of the chlorines come together, the other two come together, or there's sort of an umbrella stretch where the three chlorines come up, one goes out. Okay, in both of those cases, the symmetry is broken. The molecule is no longer a tetrahedron. And because of that, nu2 and nu3, if you look at those two, the ratio of the polarization is three 
fourths or 75 percent, 0.75, between this and this. That's a standard number. I could show how it's derived, but let's not go into that. Uh, it's just going to say that this and this, you'll see the peak in both cases. There will be a difference of about 25% between them. This one will be 25% more intense than this. But in the end, you're still going to see them both. Whereas here, it's almost a knockdown. You don't see anything at all. Now, polarization is also sensitive to the alignment of molecules. So if molecules are aligned on a surface and you hit them with vertically polarized light that lines up with the molecules, you'll see a strong Raman scatter. If you rotate it, you won't see a strong Raman scatter. This has recently been used for looking at carbon nanotubes on surfaces. And there's a seminar, one of the seminars included as part of this uh, web presence, that, that actually has that data presented and shown in it. And I recommend looking at that if you're interested in polarization. So it's used both for symmetry but also for alignment of molecules. And I think that's probably the more common use of it now is for the alignment of the molecules. So this is the idea of polarization. If the symmetry is maintained, you get a polarized peak. If the symmetry is lost, you get a depolarization ratio. That's what this number is called, sometimes represented with the letter rho as a depolarization ratio. But in the end, it's still that it, it almost goes away. If it's symmetric, you see the depolarized peak if it's, it loses the symmetry. And as I said, it also has to do with the alignment of molecules on surfaces. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll begin to look more at the instrumentation and see actually how all of this stuff that we've been talking about, lasers, detectors, polarizers, how does it all come together?